So good evening all. Today we are having a very important topic for discussion, interaction of ionizing radiation. And we have our speaker today, Dr. Sayan Das. Dr. Sayan Das is a consultant radiation oncologist at Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Sayan Das, I know him from the time of his residency. He did his MD from the prestigious Tata Memorial Hospital and senior residency also from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. So one more thing I want to tell today, we are very thankful to Dr. Sayan. He is currently an active corona patient. He is corona positive, tested corona positive and is having fever in spite of his illness. He was desperate to take today's class. So thank you very much, Dr. Sayan. And uh, I think now we can start today's class, Interactions of Ionizing Radiation by Dr. Sayan Das. Uh, thank you, uh, Sayanda, for your kind introduction. Uh, yes, uh, I am currently suffering from uh, COVID, but uh, I am extremely sorry that because of which uh, the uh, regular uh, schedule had to be changed, and I'm grateful to uh, the speaker of the previous session, Mr. Karthik, who chipped in, uh, who was supposed to take the class today, and I did not want uh, the remaining roster to uh, go into disarray because of my illness. So I was just a bit desperate to take the class today. Uh, I will be talking on interactions of ionizing radiation. Uh, shall I just scroll or how do I change from one slide to the other? Uh, is that a, a what format is it? This is I'm playing from my iPad. Okay, so uh, do one scroll. Yeah, but the thing is, there are a few animations. And if I scroll them, the animations will not be visible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is a uh, in uh, um, I mean keynote. No, no, this is not in Keynote. Uh, I am just using the uh, PowerPoint in uh, in my iPad. That's it. Okay. So... Um, can, uh, I think you have the PPT. Can you share your screen? Uh, sure, no problem. Just uh, okay, give me okay. one minute. Yeah, okay. Is it visible? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. So next slide. Uh, okay. So uh, the topic that I'll be discussing today, uh, the interactions of ionizing radiation. Now that includes several subtopics which are pretty complicated uh, for which people have been awarded uh, a Nobel Prize. So I'll try to keep them as simple as possible and I would be stressing more on the practical aspects of those interactions. Uh, just a word of caution for the beginners and the freshers that 
while giving certain examples i may be referring to certain uh, topics or certain terms which you may not be aware of so do not get disheartened keep attending our classes i'm pretty sure all those will be uh, covered in our subsequent discussions next slide uh so let's begin so let's get acquainted with the terms first so we have been discussing about ionizing radiation now radiation this term refers to energy in transit and we are basically interested in two specific forms of radiation one is particulate radiation which consists of atomic or subatomic particles that are carrying energy in the form of kinetic energy of the mass in motion which includes electrons and protons or alpha particles the other variety is the electromagnetic radiation where the energy is carried by oscillating electrical and magnetic fields traveling through space at the speed of light now electric electromagnetic radiation in most scenarios uh, behave like a wave but in certain situations especially when interacting with individual atoms they behave like discrete packets of energy is known as photon which are massless chargeless but travels at the speed of light now this uh, picture we are well aware of this is the electromagnetic spectrum uh, we will be focusing more on the right hand side of it where we find the x rays and the gamma rays so those having the highest energy but the shortest wavelength next slide so the next term is so it was ionizing radiation so we understood what radiation is now what's ionizing is these radiations while passing through matter they deposit their energy or they transfer the energy and this transfer usually occurs through ionization or excitation most commonly so ionization is what it does is 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 removes an electron from the atom thereby creating an ion pair so, so the electron gets out of the atom there is negatively charged and the atom itself becomes positively charged so ionization broadly divided into two types direct so the charged particles are called directly ionizing whereas the non uh, the uncharged ones like neutrons and photons they are called indirect because they in turn produce uh, directly ionizing uh, particles which causes further ionization next slide uh well all throughout this presentation there will be few animations which may help you in getting a better grasp of the topics uh this is one of them uh, ionization is as i said the electron is removed so uh jibok can you just click it once so there you see the uh, uh can you just repeat it once more probably yeah so there there is this photon interacting uh, with the electron the electron gets ejected from the atom thereby generating an ion i'll come to it in details later on next slide is the other form where energy is transferred from the radiation to the absorbing medium is excitation where the energy level transferred is much less than that of ionization in excitation the energy transferred is not enough for the electrons to be ejected from the atom but it can be elevated to an excited state from which it comes back to its original state and thereby the energy that it had gained is lost and that is emitted in the form of low energy uh, uh, radiations like infrared or ultraviolet almost 70% of the charged particle deposition leads to mostly non ionizing excitation as you can see in this uh, animation once again the electron is elevated to an excited state from where it will come back to its original state next slide uh before we move on to 
the specific interactions let's first understand what happens when a beam passes through a particular uh, medium there are three possibilities one the lowermost arrow as you can see the beam of photons after entering the medium the photon disappears and we say that the energy has been absorbed into the medium the topmost one you see that the beam has been deflected from its path which is known as scattering there may or may not be loss of energy accordingly it is either elastic or inelastic the third one the middle one is where it passes through the uh, absorbing medium which is called a transmitted or transmission or a transmitted beam now attenuation refers to removal of radiation from the beam by the matter now that can be either absorption or scattering so attenuation would include both absorption and scattering next slide please uh now first look at this right hand side uh diagram so consider a beam of mono energetic photons now i place a uh, absorbing medium in the path of the photons and let us assume that it is pretty pretty narrow pretty thin so the that is called the delta x that is the the thickness of the absorbing material and it has been found that the fractional reduction in the intensity of the incident beam is proportional to the thickness now you come back to the left hand side look at the first line the equation del i by i which is the fractional reduction in the intensity the minus sign denotes that the intensity gradually reduces as you increase the x as you increase the thickness the intensity gradually reduces so as i said this fractional reduction in intensity is proportional to the uh, thickness and so we have this constant here which is the mu i which is otherwise called linear attenuation coefficient now this can be defined as the fractional reduction in intensity per unit length so it is the unit is per centimeter and it is it has been found that the linear attenuation coefficient it increases linearly with the absorber density so to factor out the uh, role of the density what we do is we divide the linear attenuation coefficient with the density and that gives us the mass attenuation coefficient which is independent of the density of the medium its unit is centimeter square gram now mass attenuation coefficient in turn depends on two things one the absorber atomic number or z so higher the z there will be more atoms for interaction so the more attenuation there will be similarly if the density was not ruled out so the more dense or the more thicker your uh, absorbing medium there will be more attenuation the on the contrary if the photon energy is higher it is more penetrating so the attenuation will be less next slide now as i said the uh, fractional uh, reduction in intensity was proportional so what i mean by that is suppose unit length of the absorbing medium reduces the intensity of the incident beam by 10% so the first centimeter is unit length so say unit centimeter so first centimeter of the uh, absorbing medium reduces the intensity from 100 
to 90. The next centimeter from one to two centimeter thickness of the absorbing medium will reduce the intensity from 90 to not 80, but 81, because it will be 10% of 90. So this way we find that it, the reduction is exponential. But this is true for mono energetic beam. What happens when you have multiple energies there, or the spectrum there? So then what happens is the first uh, unit length, uh, as you keep on increasing uh, for, for, I mean, uh, uh, if you want equivalent reductions in the intensity, the thickness has to increase. Why that is so is because the initial thickness is going to is good enough to block your lower energies now that is what is called beam hardening so the remaining energies that penetrate are of higher energies so you need a thicker uh, absorbing material for a similar fractional reduction in the intensity next slide this brings us to this important concept of half value layers or half value thickness what does that mean is the thickness of an absorber that is required to attenuate the intensity of a mono energetic photon beam. All these words are very, very important. So it attenuates the intensity of a mono energetic beam to half of its original value. It denotes the quality or the penetrating power of the beam. As you can see in the right side the diagram, the first uh, half value layer reduce it to 50%, the second one to 25%, third one to 12.5%. And theoretically, it can never be zero. And if you uh, think uh, the linear attenuation coefficient has a relationship with half value layer, does it seem uh, or does it look similar to some? some other relationship, I can give you a hint. Uh, similar relations you will find in your radioactive decay constant with your half-life. Now, how this relationship is obtained, that is a homework for you all. Uh, next slide. Uh, now let's come, uh, okay, so uh, we are dividing the remaining part of the uh, lecture into two groups. First, I'll be uh, discussing on the interaction of photons with matter, and then I'll be discussing about interaction of the charged particles with matter. Now, photons transfer the energy in very complex interactions, which I'll be coming. Now, there are different or various possibilities of photon interactions. Uh, as per one uh, paper, there are 12 possible interactions. So based on the kinds of interaction and the effects of interactions, so four on the left side and three on the left side, you can do a combination, find out 12 combinations. But uh, fortunately for us, majority are of no uh, use for us. So I'll be only talking about those which are of uh, a practical uh, significance. Next slide. So let's begin with photoelectric effect. So, Emission of electrons, which are otherwise called photoelectrons, from a surface when light is shined on it. This is known as photoelectric effect. It was first observed way back in 1839, but it was Albert Einstein who ultimately explained and uh, got the uh, Nobel Prize in 1921. Uh, and it was. <laughs> Uh, Einstein did not receive the Nobel Prize for his more popular relativity. Next slide. So, okay, so again, another uh, animation. So before I go to the animation, let me just tell you what exactly happens. Focus on the right-hand side diagram first. What you see is that there is this photon which is interacting with an electron. So what happens is if the incident photon interacts with an electron and the, it has sufficient energy to 
eject the electron out of its orbit or out of its shell. Then that ejected electron is called the photoelectron. Now, EPE, PE is the photoelectron. The energy or the kinetic energy gained by it is equal to E0, that is the incident photon's energy, minus the binding energy. So if it was a K shell electron, so it has to, I mean, utilize that, the, the binding energy of that particular shell, and then the remaining energy that is left, it's used up as its kinetic energy. Uh, the important thing is that photoelectrons are usually, or the photoelectric effect usually happens with interaction between the photon and the inner shell electrons. And as you know, if the electron is removed from an inner shell, that vacancy will be filled up by an electron from another shell lying uh, above it. And then that electron fills up and that electron will lose energy in the form of characteristic X-rays or it can even generate auger electrons. Now that these has been discussed previously, so I'll not go into them. Now let's play the animation. So Jiva, can you play it once more for a better understanding? So look at the photon, the photon, what it does is it pushes one of the green colors. So the K-shell electron is pushed out and then its place is filled up by one of the yellow electrons from the upper shell. Next slide, please. So what are the practical implications? Now, this mode of uh, interaction of photon is mostly seen in the lower energies. It is the primary mode of interaction in diagnostic radiology. Uh, tau. Tau is the uh, attenuation coefficient of photo, this, the photoelectric attenuation coefficient. Now, the attenuation coefficient is, in a way, uh, tells us about the probability of the attenuation occurring because the attenuation is actually a very random event. Now, this photoelectric attenuation is found to be proportional to cube of the atomic number of the absorbing medium and inversely proportional to the energy of the incident photons. So, which means that with increasing Z, the photoelectric effect becomes more. And with increasing energy, the photoelectric effect becomes less. So we can say that photoelectric effect predominates at low energies with high Z materials. Now, what happens is the other way, the other important thing is, because it is the cube of Z, so even small differences in Z, say between fat, muscle, and bone, gets amplified because of the photoelectric attenuation which gives us a very improved image contrast, which is why it is very useful for diagnostic radiology. Also, the very basis of using contrast medium while taking your uh, images is useful because the contrast material has a very high Z, which again gives a very uh, a good contrast. In therapeutic radiology, again, it uh, the low energy beams in orthovoltage radiotherapy, which is, which is no longer used now, they cause excessive absorption of energy in the bone, leading to significant uh, side effects like osteoradionecrosis. And the other thing that used to happen with orthovoltage radiotherapy was bone shielding. Uh, I'll come to it when I discuss with, uh, about uh, Compton effect. Next slide, please. So let me show you these examples. This, you see, the effective Z for bone is around 14. The effective Z for soft tissue is around 7. So this difference gets uh, amplified, which gives us a nice contrast when we take an X-ray. Similarly, barium, which is used for barium swallow, has a Z of 56. Again, such a beautiful contrast. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, so again, this is something really interesting. 
uh, this is a curve which is plotting photon energy against the incidence of photoelectric absorption. Now, what you find is, or what we have already mentioned is that with increase in photon energy, the attenuation or the photoelectric attenuation gradually decreases. Now, that is seen from this curve. But at certain energies, you see a sudden jump in the photoelectric attenuation. Now, these particular energies are found to correspond to the binding energies of the electrons in different shells. Accordingly, these uh, sudden jumps are named as per which shell it is. So a K shell is called a K absorption edge. The L1 is called the L absorption edge and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Now, why this happens is because, as I said, the photoelectric effect has a tendency to uh, or the probability of photoelectric in effective uh, photoelectric interaction uh, occurring in an atom is more with the inner shell electrons. Now you imagine, say in this example, say if I give you the example of lead. So for lead, the K shell binding energy is around 88 keV. Now, a photon energy which is less than 88, say 80 keV, there the energy is not adequate to eject the K shell electron. But as soon as the energy crosses 88 keV, so say at 90 keV, the probability of photoelectron effect increases sharply. Because now all the electrons are now available for photoelectric interactions. This is the reason behind such rapid jumps. Now, what happens is that uh, at, at and around the absorption edges, the low energy photons are less attenuated because these slightly higher energy uh, photons, which are slightly more than the binding energies uh, of that particular shell, are now getting attenuated by interacting with the uh, inner shell electrons, whereas the low energy atoms, the low energy photons penetrate uh, or they get less attenuated and are found to be more penetrating. Now this is seen or this is what happens when we use filters. Because what we say is that the filters are transparent to their characteristic radiation. Now what does that mean? I'll come to it now. Next slide. So, uh, so filters are used for hardening a beam. So what I mean, what do I mean by hardening a beam is, I want to remove. So when there is, uh, the, so when X-rays are produced, we all know that there is this spectrum, but the lower energies are of no use to us. They only increase the surface dose. So. I want to remove the lower energy photons and make use of the higher energy ones only. So for that, I place a filter in the path of the beam, which will block the lower energy ones. So in the ortho voltage range, we typically use the Thorius filters, which is a three layered filter composed of tin, copper and aluminum. Now, the characteristic radiation of tungsten, that is the source, uh, the characteristic radiation of tungsten is in the range of say 58 to 69 keV. Now, in this range, so when, uh, so if I put tin in as a, as a filter, the tin scatial binding energy is around 29 keV. So what it does is that this will block the higher energy photons by photoelectric interaction. But the lower energy photons will be penetrating. It will not be attenuated by this tin. Or in other way, the photoelectric interaction, which would lead to generating the characteristic radiation, will be penetrating and passing through the filter. So I need to block those low energy photons, for which I will have to place a layer of copper. Now, copper's K shell 
or binding energy the k absorption age is 9 keV so this copper will now block the low energy photons in the range of 9 to 30 above 30 is already blocked by tin but this in turn will again have much lower energy so less than 9 keVs will still pass through this will then further be blocked by aluminium beyond that it is much much low which is uh, unlikely to be of any uh, use next slide please next we come to the compton effect uh, it is also otherwise known as incoherent or inelastic scattering it is strictly a photon electron interaction or in other words people call it that here a photon interacts with a free electron now what do i mean by a free electron is when the energy of the photon is much more than the binding energy of the electron with which it is interacting so compton effect mostly occurs with the outer shell electrons whose binding energy is much much less than the interacting photons now arthur compton uh, got the nobel prize for explaining this uh, compton effect which kind of proved the dual nature of light next slide please okay so let's have a look at the animation first so the photon comes interacts with an electron look what happens once again is the photon gets deflected and the electron that gets scattered gets deflected in another direction okay next slide so what happened was in a very simplified diagram the photon interacted with the electron the photon got uh, scattered to one direction and it ejected the electron which uh, went in the other direction now the the interesting thing about this is the angle through which this uh photons got deflected or, or the energy of the scattered photon or the energy of the deflected electrons all these do not depend on the properties of the absorbing medium uh i'll come to it in details later on so again simply put the photon interacts with an outer shell electron ejects it while in the same uh, manner it gets deflected through a certain degree next slide please so if we see there are two angles the angle through which the photon gets deflected is called phi while the angle through which the electron gets deflected is called theta next slide now the photon that gets deflected or the scattered undergoes a change in its wavelength so that change the delta lambda that change in wavelength if you see this formula depends on phi that is the angle through which the photon got deflected and it does not depend on the density or the atomic number or any other property of the absorbing material however the angular distribution of the photon so by what angle they will get deflected that depends on the incident photon energy so if you look at this diagram again the incident photon interacts with the electron the ejected electron is called the recoil electron or the compton electron and the scattered photon which is of somewhat lower energy and the remaining energy is transferred to the ejected recoil electron now this energy will be again minus the binding energy of that particular shell next slide so i'll give you a few typical situations first one is called a grazing hit where the photon that is the phi is almost undergoing no change in its direction whereas the electron undergoes a 90 degree uh, scatter uh, let's look at the animation so this is what is called a grazing hit or a glancing blow 
Next slide. Uh, so the other way, other one is a direct hit where the photon is backscattered. So the uh, so angle of scatter for the photon is 180 degrees, which so traces back its own path, uh, while the electron is pushed in the forward direction. In this form of a hit, so the electron receives maximum energy and the photon loses maximum energy, leading to the drastic change in the wavelength. Next slide. Now, how much energy is shared between the photon and the recoil electron. Now this table is for a particular given angle, but the feature holds true for all angles. What we see here is this table shows primary photon energies, scattered photon energies, and the recoil electron energies. And we see as the energy of the primary photon increases, look at the red one, the percentage of the initial energy of the recoil electron keeps on increasing. So at lower energies, only 2% of the initial energy of the primary photon gets transferred to the recoil electron, whereas at much, much higher energies, almost 96% gets transferred to the recoil electron. So at higher energies, most of it goes to the electron, whereas at lower energies, most of it is scattered. Now, so high energy radiations are less likely to be scattered because the energy removed by the scatter photon is much smaller fraction. This also uh, shows that uh, at higher energies, these scatter radiation intensity is much, much less. Now, next slide, please. Okay, so look at this thing. This is again, very interesting. This uh, chart or this curves, this is a relative probability of Compton scattering versus the scattering angle phi for different incident photon energies. Now look at the topmost curve. So that is the curve for the 10 keV photons. What happens at 10 keV is so on the so it is plotted of plotting um, the plot of the scattering angle versus the probability of scattering what we find is that at lower energies so at 10 kev the probability of the scatter angle being either 0 or 180 is pretty high and it is minimum for a 90 degree scatter now as you increase your energy the probability of the scatter angle is more towards zero degrees and very, very low probability for a complete backscatter. So at say a five MeV, the backscatter probability is close to 0 0.001. This is again shown in this right hand side diagram. If you see uh, the green one is at the lowest energy, the green shell, the dumbbell shaped curve. Now you know why the shape is dumbbell shaped because as I showed at lower energies, at 90 degrees, the probability of scatter is least, whereas it is most for a zero degree or a 180 degree scatter. This gives this typical dumbbell shape or a, a bean shape, it's a typical dumbbell shape. Now, as you increase your energies, so it is the chance of the probability of forward scatter gradually increases. So if you see at very high energies, so the D1, which is the dark brown one, two MEVs, the amount of backscatter is almost nil, and all of it is in the forward direction. Next slide. Now, just like photoelectric attenuation coefficient, there is a scattering uh, attenuation coefficient, which is uh, symbolized with sigma. Uh, since Compton effect deals with electrons, so the scattering attenuation coefficient, it depends on the number of electrons, or in other words, the electron density. 
it does not depend on the atomic number or the uh, density or the energy it depends on the electron density or how many free electrons are available for interaction now practically the electron density is same for all substances except hydrogenous materials uh, like water and soft tissues uh, because in hydrogenous materials the electron density if you can see in the lower two values is it is almost double than that of the other substances so the others in the range of 2 to 3 whereas for hydrogen is close to 6 so in hydrogenous material the compton effect is much more pronounced because of greater electron density whereas in the others it's almost the same irrespective of the material next slide so let's come to the practical implications now as i said attenuation is same for all substances except for your hydrogenous materials it is independent of z which other in other words we can say that even concrete is as good as lead for radiation shielding uh, for uh, uh, for compton effect but remember this that it has to be equivalent density it for this statement holds true provided the density is equivalent no bone shielding as seen in orthovoltage radiation is because in lower energies in orthovoltage radiation where photoelectric effect predominates what happens is that the bones having a higher z than soft tissue will tend to attenuate the beam much more as such it is difficult to treat tumors which are located beyond or behind the bone say for example a lung tumor could not be treated with orthovoltage because the ribs will block the uh, beams or would kind of attenuate most of the beam with a uh, compton effect this is no longer true with higher energies you see greater absorption of dose and there is less scattering and more of it is forward scattered leading to better dose distributions the energy of the scattered radiation is independent of the incident beam energy this is very important for designing secondary barriers for radiation protection i will not go into the details uh the other is the metallic artifacts uh which uh plays a role for treatment planning or calculation of dose distribution and even for image guidance which can be done with mvct images i'll explain this now next slide uh i don't know how many uh, the beginners may not be aware of this uh, but electronic portal imaging uh, many of you must have come across this so these are tools for your uh, onboard imaging for your image guidance so these are uh, images using mega voltage beams so their compton effect plays a role as it is independent of z so the contrast is much much less you see such beautiful contrast when photo effect electric effect plays a role but at higher energies where compton effect is much more prominent are uh, predominant there your mvct images have very poor contrast next slide please but the advantage is that because it is independent of z in scenarios where you have hip implants or dental implants which produce significant uh, artifacts in your ct image that can be avoided if you do a mvct so the metallic objects produce those artifacts which can impair your image fusion or your target delineation uh, also it limits your electron density correction because the treatment planning system that we use what they do is they convert the house filled in units into electron densities but these kind of artifacts they can lead to errors in this electron density correction and in those calculations these can be minimized using an mvct next slide i think a better example is there in the next image so as you can see this is this hip implant so the significant artifact which can be uh minimized with an mvct next slide so the third uh important uh interaction that i must talk about is pair production uh this 
was explained by Carl Anderson, who received the Nobel Prize for the same in 1936. What pair production in, uh, comprises of is here the photon interacts with the electromagnetic field of the nucleus, gives up all its energy, and in the process, it creates a pair of electron and a positron. So this is done using the uh, law of conservation of mass and energy. So the photon in the form of energy is converted into mass. Next slide. So the resting mass energy of an electron is equivalent to 0.511 MeV. So if this energy is converted to mass, is the equivalent mass of an electron. So the photon energy must be twice of this value because it produces two particles, one electron and one positron. So the photon energy must be at least 1.022 MeV. And so what happens is a photon beam of at least this energy, if when it interacts with the electromagnetic field of the atomic nucleus, it will create an electron and a positron and the remaining energy after creating these two particles shall be divided between these two uh, newly generated particles as their kinetic energy. So you can see in the right hand diagram, so the incident photon generates an electron and a positron and this positron while moving as it nears its end of its range and it gradually loses energy as it moves through the medium. This will combine with the surrounding electron because electrons are there all around. And this positron, after combining with an electron, undergoes an annihilation reaction. And the reverse happens here. Mass is again converted back to energy following the law of conservation of mass and energy and generates two photons, each of energy 0.511 MeV, which are then uh, released or emitted in opposite directions. Next slide. So let's play the animation. So this photon interacts with the uh, field of the nucleus and it generates two particles, one electron and one positron. Next slide. So, so these two, one is a positron, one combines with an electron and it generates two photons which move in the opposite directions. Next slide. So what are the implications? Now, as we said, in photoelectric effect, that attenuation reduces with increasing energy. Compton effect was independent of the energy, but pair production increases with energy. And uh, as it is mainly due to interaction of the photon with the magnetic field of the nucleus, so the likelihood increases with the nuclear charge, or in other words, with Z. So, pi, which is the pair production attenuation coefficient, is proportional to Z and proportional to log of the energy of the incident photon. Now, as it depends on Z, again, just like uh, your photoelectric effect, there is more dose to the bones or uh, structures. Those have higher Z will have or will cause more attenuation. Next slide. Uh, the usefulness of the utility of the annihilation reaction, I'll just explain in this single slide, is if you have heard of functional imaging or the PET scan, the so positron emission tomography. So what it does is uh, the one who is undergoing the scan gets injected with a radio pharmaceutical, which uh, contains an isotope that emits positron. Now that positron will combine with an electron 
undergo an annihilation reaction and will generate two photons that are emitted in bang opposite directions. Now, as you can see in this diagram, the patient's body is surrounded with multiple CT detectors. Uh, or multiple detectors. So what these detectors do is that any emitted photon in bang opposite directions at the same instant will be considered to be produced from the same annihilation reaction which must have happened along the line joining those two photons. Now this fundamental principle is then used by creating a back projection algorithm to generate an image. Next slide. Okay, so just a few words about a uh, few more interactions. I think two more. One is the photonuclear reaction uh, for you know, James Chadwick, who discovered neutron by bombarding beryllium with alpha particles, and he won the Nobel Prize for the same. So here, much higher energy photons. So the threshold energy for pair production was 1.022 MeV for photo disintegration or photonuclear reaction the threshold is 10 mev and the maximum is around in the range of 15 mev so what it does is uh, at such higher energies it is able to pierce or go beyond the binding energy that holds the nucleons together and ejects a particle from the nucleus itself it can be a proton or a neutron more commonly a neutron gets ejected uh, this again increases with Z because the more uh, number of nucleuses are there, the more likelihood of this kind of interaction. Next slide. Uh, the again, just a few words about the practical implications is the neutron quantum. So when you use such high energy photons, uh, you tend to produce such neutrons which have a relatively high relative biological effectiveness, which is almost 10 times more effective at causing biological damage compared to your uh, gamma radiation. Uh, and unwanted neutron exposure can be a contributory factor for second malignancies. Uh, the other important uh, implication is, again, with regards to radiation shielding for fast neutrons, you need to have hydrogen rich material because it undergoes elastic scattering or elastic interactions with hydrogen, thereby losing its energy because uh, the size of a neutron and size of a hydrogen nucleus is almost the same. So thereby a fast neutron gets converted into a slow neutron, which can then be uh, captured. Next slide. Uh, just the question that why don't we use higher energy beams more than say 15 or 18 MV is firstly you have a high exit dose you tend to have more pair productions and I said as there's more pair production there will be uh, more dose to your bones and you tend to have more neutron contaminations because of increased proportion of photo disintegration now say a 15 MV beam the average energy would be a 5 MV so majority of the uh, your photons will not be uh, uh, undergoing photo disintegration, but the higher energy ones have the uh, chances of undergoing a uh, causing a photo disintegration, thereby producing neutrons. Next slide. Uh, the last one is the coherent scattering, where uh, it involves the bound electrons. It happens in very low. This is uh, useful. I mean, it occurs with very low energy uh, x-rays which is mostly used for diagnostic purposes say in the range of 15 to 30 keV there is no ionization only the bound electrons they momentarily vibrate at the same frequency as that of, that of the incident photon and then the vibrating electrons in turn will emit x-rays in the same frequency in all directions there is no absorption of energy in this form of interaction. As such, it's again, is of not of much use. Next slide, please. Uh, 
it's of nuisance value for radiology and radiotherapy, but of is of use for X-ray crystallography. We scatter probabilities again proportional to Z square, but inversely proportional to the energy. It occurs more in higher atomic number materials because there are more bound electrons, and it occurs more with low energy radiations. Next slide. Just one example that I want to talk about is mammography. So in mammography, 95% is the photoelectric effect. However, there is 5% scattering. Some of it is Compton, some of it is elastic scattering, which distorts the image. And there are ways to reduce this kind of distortion is we usually ask the breast to be compressed so that less tissue has to be traversed through, thereby having less scatter. And we use grid, usually made of lead, which kind of uh, absorbs most of the scattered uh, photons. Next slide. So uh, if we focus on the three most important interactions, which are photoelectric effect, Compton effect, and pair production, what we find is that all of them produce either a high energy secondary electrons or secondary photons. So for photoelectric effect, it would be characteristic X-rays or your photoelectrons or auger electrons. For Compton effect, it's a scattered photon and a recoil electron. For pair production, it's an annihilation photon and a positron electron pair. Now, these high energy electrons are the ones which are responsible for the deposition of energy in matter while uh, the radiation uh, gets passes through the uh, uh, absorbing medium. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I'll just discuss these attenuation coefficients together. Now, the mass attenuation coefficient is a sum of these individual coefficients. The photoelectric coefficient, the uh, scatter attenuation coefficient and the pair production attenuation coefficient, the tau, sigma, and pi. Uh, as I've already mentioned, tau is proportional to Z cube and inversely proportional to the E cube. Uh, sigma is, for practical purposes, uh, independent of Z and E. Pi is zero for energy levels less than 1.022 MeV because that's the minimum threshold that is required. Thereafter, it is proportional to Z log E. Next slide. Uh, look at these three. So there they have plotted mass attenuation coefficient versus photon energy in three different absorbing mediums of different Z. So water, sodium iodide, and lead. What you see is that the blue line, the blue dotted line, that is uh, tau or uh, the photoelectric attenuation, that as you increase your photon energy, it reduces. But if you look at the three different curves, as your Z increases, the, uh, uh, the amount of your uh, tau gradually increases. Look at the pink line, that is the sigma, which is almost the same irrespective of your Z. And there is a subtle, some change only with increasing energy. Kappa or pi, the pair production attenuation coefficient, is does not occur before 1.022. But after that, as you increase Z, it is gradually increasing. Next slide. Uh, now, what are the relative importance of these interactions? Now, at lo as I said, at low energies, photoelectric interactions predominate. So, especially in high atomic number media. And if you see, look at this curve. So, there are one, two, three, four lines. One is, the first one is the, the probability of the photoelectric effect. Uh, the second one is the Compton effect, third one is the pair production, and on top of all of them is the total probability of these interactions. Now, as you can see, that at lower energies, the attenuation probability is much high. And there, the predominant effect is from the photoelectric effect. Next slide. As your energy increases, 
you see the total probability of attenuation gradually decreases and the compton effect plays a predominant role in this energy range uh this is usually taken considered to be between 200 kev to 4 mev next slide please at much higher energies so acha at this energy range uh the mass attenuation coefficient also becomes it is it is uh, independent of the atomic number z uh because uh, that is what is it holds true for the compton effect and it is more for soft tissues because of more hydrogenous content next slide uh at much higher energies again pair production becomes much more predominant and gradually the mass attenuation coefficient again starts increasing next slide uh the crossover point so at what energy levels at which particular interaction is predominates again depends on the material so for water the junction for photoelectric and compton is around 50 kev whereas for compton and pair production is in the range of 5 mev but for lead it is uh, much much pushed towards the right hand side so photoelectron and compton range is in the range of 500 kev while compton and pair production is in the range of 20 mev next slide uh again this is already been explained this is kind of the what is the most probable interaction versus photon energy for different z materials so as is seen at lower energies with high z photoelectric absorption predominates at uh high z and high energy pair production predominates but in the energy range that we are mostly working with compton scattering is the predominant mode of interaction next slide uh just i'll try to be as brief as possible now the interactions of charged particles with matter uh so here the incident particles unlike the way it happens with photons for charged particles when they interact with uh, matter it is mostly through the coulombic forces of attraction or repulsion rather than a direct mechanical heat so when the incident charged particle passes very close to an orbital electron uh, it can cause uh, by a force of uh, uh, attraction or repulsion it can cause ejection of the ele electron from its atom thereby causing ionization for a less distant uh, interaction it can cause excitation and when it interacts with the nucleus it can cause bremsstrahlung production next slide uh okay so this curve is plotting electron energy versus the rate of loss of energy now when charged particle interacts with matter there are two kinds of loss of energy one is collisional and one is radiation loss collisional loss occurs through ionization or excitation radiative loss occurs through bremsstrahlung now if you look at these curves there are four curves two are for collisional with water and lead that is two different z and two are for radiative losses now if you see with the energy range that we have uh, concerned about collisional losses are the predominant mode of loss of energy however as your energy increases your radiative loss gradually increases in fact it increases in a very sharp rate however with higher z the uh, collisional loss is much more for lower z materials i mean the uh, collisional loss is much more for higher z materials than for lower z materials now why is that so so at higher energies the collisional loss tends to be less because of the velocity effect 
So at higher energy, the electrons which are traveling at a very fast rate have less time to interact with the other uh, subatomic particles, thereby being less densely ionizing. So they travel a longer distance before they undergo uh, a, a, a reduction or uh, the loss in energy. Uh, what happens with higher Z materials is that with higher Z materials, the electrons, so the inner shell electrons are kind of screened by the outer shell electrons. So there are less uh, electrons available for interaction. So that's why the loss is much more for lower Z than for higher Z. Next slide. Uh, just a uh, brief discussion on the charged particle tracks. Alpha particles, they are being much heavier than electrons. They are really deflected after getting interaction or interacting with an electron. So they are, so the track is mostly a straight one and they keep on losing energies with uh, multiple interactions with uh, different electrons ultimately uh, losing their internal energy at the end of their track. Whereas electrons, uh, and they are being less densely ionizing, as I said, because for the same amount of energy uh, compared to an alpha particle, the electron is much, much more fast moving. So they travel a longer distance before they undergo some change in direction or deflection or uh, a Bremsstrahl uh, radiative loss. So electrons tend to have a tortuous and longer tracks, while alpha particles tend to have a short, densely ionized tracks. Next slide. Uh, these are some concepts which I wanted to discuss, uh, like the energy deposition along a track. So this is the, the total energy loss rate of a charged particle, which is expressed in MeV per centimeter is called the linear stopping power, which is used useful for uh, your uh, shielding purpose. A very closely related parameter is the linear energy transfer, which refers to the energy lost that is deposited locally along the track. So what is the difference between a linear stopping power and a linear energy transfer is that Linear energy transfer does not include the radiative losses. Now, the energy energy that we talk about, the electrons or the alpha particles have minimal losses, so that quantities are practically the same. Next slide. Uh, okay, so a few more. So specific ionization, what is specific ionization? It refers to the uh, total number of ion pairs that are produced by the primary and secondary ionization events by unit of track length. So linear energy transfer was the average energy transferred along the track length, while specific ionization refers to the total number of ion pairs produced by unit track length. So if I take a ratio of them, what I get is the average energy spent or expended per ionization event, which is called W. W is usually found to be same for uh, different particles with different energies, which means that LET is kind of proportional to the specific ionization. Uh, the other concept is that of ionization potential, which speaks about the average energy required to cause an ionization in a material. The difference between W and I is that W includes both ionization as well as excitation, while I includes only ionization. Next slide. Uh, okay, so I think there are only two curves remaining. This is the specific ionization for electrons versus energy in air. So this is a plot of energy versus ion pairs per millimeter of track length. What it shows is that as your energy reduces, your specific ionization keeps on increasing. Why is that so? Has already been explained by the velocity effect. So as your energy reduces, your velocity is less, so you have more chance of producing ions. 
so that's why the ionization keeps on increasing at about say 100 electron volt it sharply reduces because your energy is now much less to effectively cause ionization next slide the next one is that of alpha particles uh, this is uh, the same curve but it's represented in a different way is this time uh, we have kept the x-axis as the distance from the end of the range so again what this shows is at this the alpha particles nears the end of their range the ionization density gradually increases and then it reaches its peak just before it loses all its energy and comes back to zero this sharp peak is known as the Bragg ionization peak next slide uh, I think this is the last one that I just wanted to mention is the Cherenkov effect. So this occurs when a charged particle travels in a medium at a speed greater than the speed of light in that medium. Now this may seem a bit paradoxical because we know that it is difficult to cross the speed of light. But remember that is speed of light in vacuum. What I've mentioned is the speed of light in a particular medium. So that is possible. And that is what is commonly seen around a nuclear reactor where we find this kind of a bluish uh, emission of light. So next slide. I'm not going to quite late. So to summarize, so charged particles are either directly, uh, just with that directly ionizing while the uncharged particles are indirectly ionizing. Photon beams interact with matter through five major processes. Uh, tau is proportional to Z cube and inversely proportional to E cube. Sigma is independent of Z and E, while pi is proportional to Z and log of E. And charged particles interact primarily by ionization, excitation, or Bremsstrahlung. Uh, next slide, please. So, thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, I would like to thank the core team of the Young Radiation Oncologist Club, especially Dr. Sian Ball, who has been uh, of tremendous help because he kept on kind of encouraging me all through my sickness. Uh, thanks to Dr. Rima Pathak, my uh, very good senior and a very good friend of mine, because all these animations I got from, I mean, I, I, I took her slides. Uh, Ajay is another of my junior. I took some of his slides as well. And, um, uh, and I, I, I did receive help from Dr. Manu Matthew with the study materials. So now I think it's time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Sain. It was a, a wonderful class, I must say. With all your illness, uh, fever and everything, the amount of effort that you have given is really commendable. Uh, we can take the question answers now. Mm, questions now, uh, Dr. Jibak. Yeah, just a minute. Uh, give yeah. me one minute, just. Sure. Okay, so we will start with uh, the first question. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Shraddha, he's asking why innermost orbit electrons are ejected in low energy uh, range. That means the photoelectric effect. Okay, so again, this uh, <clears throat> there is a very complicated formula which kind of shows. Uh, that the probability is much more. It is not true that it will only happen with the inner uh, shell electrons, but the likelihood is much more. Uh, but again, the explanation is beyond the scope. It is, it is very, very complicated. I mean, it's very if really interested, you can... So if you're really interested, you can uh, sit down with a medical physicist because I asked my own physicists and they kind of showed me a formula which was, I mean, way above my understanding. Yeah, the same thing was asked in uh, uh, YouTube also. He's saying binding energy of electron in K-shell is greater than higher shells. Why is photoelectric effect more prominent at lower photon beam energies as compared to Compton effect? The same question is basically. Uh, yes, but again, so if people are really interested, okay, then I can add some additional material and then but it, it is pretty complicated i don't know any other panelists would like to add something because i did sit down with our physicists and then it was it was uh, the explanation that they put forward was 
pretty difficult to grasp. So let's go to the next question. Uh, so uh, Dr. Bashundara is uh, asking for a repetition of the absorption edges. Okay. So I think we have so, to go back to field. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. what happens is that, as I said, so if you plot the photoelectric attenuation with increasing energy, uh, as I said, photoelectric attenuation is inversely proportional to uh, the cube of the energies. So I think the previous slide. Yeah. So you see, as the photon energy increases, the absorption or the attenuation, uh, attenuation uh, to the photoelectric attenuation gradually decreases. But at certain energy levels, there is this short, sudden jump. So and these energy levels are, are the soaking energy of these particular shells. Uh, now, what happens is this. So the, the explanation that I was telling is at these, so for the K edge, at that particular energy level uh, the, of the, the incident photon having that particular energy, can now eject all electrons in that particular atom. So say for lead, it is 88 keV. So a 88 keV photon or 89 keV photon can now eject any electron. But an 87 keV can eject the remaining 80 electrons, but not the two k shell electrons. Now, this may seem that Okay, so what's the big deal? So 87 to 89, so 2 keV increase in energy of the photon. So the, uh, uh, the increase in the attenuation should be so from 80 electrons to 82 electrons. So hardly say 1.5 to 2 percent jump. But what you actually see is almost a seven times jump in the attenuation. Now, the very reason I said the explanation is beyond the scope of this discussion as of now if you're really interested i'll try to send you some material jibok was that the question Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I, I just got disconnected due to poor connection and uh, I ah, the okay. my screen is not showing any further question. So uh, all are actually lost. Okay, so, so, so I, I, I don't know, I, I can see yeah, them. So can I answer I, them yeah. now? Yeah, sure. Yes, yes, I can also see them, no problem. So okay. another one okay. is uh, why metallic implant don't cause any uh, artifact with uh, MB CBC image that uh, I think you have explained already. Yeah, because it is independent of the Z, yeah. independent of the atomic number. So whether it is independent of what material is there. So that's yes. why uh, there won't be any uh, artifacts because of the metallic implants. So why are hydrogenous compounds are not used for neutron protection? Yeah, that's what I said. So uh, when you are, say, shielding from uh, a fast neutron, say, for example, if you want to shield from X-rays, lead is a very good uh, useful shielding block. But lead is not at all useful for shielding neutrons because neutrons or say a fast-moving neutron interacts well only with particles which have the size same as that of a fast-moving neutron, which I said is true in case of a hydrogen nucleus. A hydrogen nucleus includes a proton. So the size of a proton and a neutron is almost the same. So there, the exchange of the transfer of energy is... So if you see the neutrons interaction, it's just like a, a, a billiard game. So it's mostly uh, an elastic 
scattering thereby there will be transfer of energy from the neutron to the proton or the hydrogen nucleus so that's why hydrogens or hydrogenous material like a polyethylene are really useful for stopping fast moving neutrons or converting fast moving neutrons into slow moving neutrons which can thereby be uh, absorbed by other materials like concrete difference between let and stopping power so let is more useful for your radio biological aspects stopping power is more used for your shielding purposes so as i said or as i mentioned so can we go back to that which one uh, let let and your stopping power uh is yes, no, the one previous to it i think the previous slide okay so so linear stopping power is the rate of loss of energy of a charged particle so per unit track length what is the rate of loss of energy now <clears throat> let refers to the energy lost that is deposited locally along the track now linear stopping power includes so what are the forms of lo losing energy either you lose it by collisional loss or by radiative loss now linear stopping power includes all sorts of loss while let measures only the energy that is lost along the track while radiative loss occurs at a some distance away from the track so let disregards radiative loss but stopping power includes everything so that's why i mean that is the basic difference between stopping power and let but again as i mentioned for practical purposes the uh, in this energy range where we work the radiation loss is minimal for charged particles like electrons and alpha particles so there the two quantities are almost the same uh so this uh, section i think all the questions one or two how safe one new question is remain treating patients ha, how safe, how safe is it to use 15 15 mv yeah till 15 mv is okay i mean as i said so the i mean we do not use more than 15 because with more higher energies you tend to have more pair production and with or i mean further energies or far much higher energies you tend to have much more of your uh, photo disintegration so there you will have more neutron contamination there will be more exit dose the most common problem would be more exit dose so i think no one wants that so how safe is it to use 15 mb yes see what i felt i can give you a, a bit of philosophical answer is if you look at it i think it's a nature's gift of uh, treating cancers using radiotherapy with these sort of energies with the sort of doses with distribution and the sort of separation that we human beings have it is typical of in this range of say 4 to uh, 15 or say i was for 4 to 15 or 4 to really 18 uh and this range is suitable for treating cancer patients with the sort of separation that we have anything less than that is not suitable anything more than that will tend to cause much more problems but again it's a kind of a philosophical answer may not uh be palatable for you so from youtube we have one question i think which is relevant others you have already answered and we are not going to repeat any part because we are already late that is why compton effect is higher in case of hydrogenous material i think that is important for the student yeah so as i already mentioned so compton effect is dictated by electron density because compton effect that the photons are interacting with as i mentioned in the very beginning the so called free electrons so the loosely bound electrons in the outer shell so the more such loosely bound electrons will be there the compton effect will be much more now the electron density for all practical purposes in all materials is almost the same there are lists available in most of the textbooks you see uh, all of them in the range of so 2 to 3 uh, of a particular given unit while for hydrogen and for hydrogenous materials 
like water or or even soft tissues it is almost the double so double means there is more electrons the electron density is more so the compton effect will be more i yes, hope that exactly. answers your question yeah yes exactly hydrogen is actually one proton and one electron yes so i think we have covered all the questions and uh, thank you dr sain once again you must take rest now we were continuously teaching for one and a half hour so uh, it was really really wonderful talk thank you very much and thank you everyone for thank participating you, thank you thank you thank you thank you